wasn't even supposed to say all that. So <laughs> welcome to Cornerstone. If you're visiting, we're so glad you're here. Um, I love the Christmas season. This is a time of hope, and uh, we have it in our hearts, and we need to share it. So anywho, um, isn't this place decorated just so nicely? In every corner, you're going to see stuff. If you go in the bathroom, if you go in the gathering place, uh, Teresa Hall, can we, uh, where is she? She's in the back. Teresa, thank you. <laughs> uh, kids, would you like to go to Sunday school? It's time. Could I have the ushers come? Lord, thanks for this opportunity to serve you with our finances. We just thank you, Lord, for your abundant blessings in all of our lives, Lord. And uh, when we contribute to Cornerstone Fellowship, we're giving to the whole world, Lord. And I just thank you for the people um, that are able to share in that. We're, uh, we're a family, and uh, we just thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. So let's see, small groups. We still have three of them. If you're interested, see anybody, and we'll get you hooked up. There's uh, Monday night, Sunday night for college age, if you happen to be in that age gap, and uh, Wednesday night. So it is like doing church, really. Anywho, don't get me started. Um, let's see. Pregnancy Center. Um, we did the Christmas um, gifts, and today is the very last day to do that. And I do thank you for all that have done that. It's, I'm sure it's a special time that uh, mothers and fathers can go uh, shop for their kids and pick out their own gift. And st I mean, it's cool that we, you know, give a wrapped gift and they don't know what they're getting. But when a mom and dad can know their own child and pick out a gift, it's cool. Uh, so speaking of wrapping up gifts, the shem boxes. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the tree downstairs, but it does have names. And so we have children that have said what their, like, dress size is, what they're into. Um, so it, it does help in buying them a gift that they would be interested in. Um, so if you want to pick out one, they'll probably go today because uh, how many families do, how many kids do we have, Pearl? Okay. So maybe if you don't pick one up today, those watching online, you might have a chance. Or you can come by the church office. We're open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday from 9 to 3. And uh, so come on down. I'm even here sometimes. So uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. We are going to be having a candlelight service. Um, if you're able, this is a very cool family tradition. Um, because it's on a Saturday, we're going to do it a little bit early so that families can have more family time in the evening. So it's from 4.30 to 5.30 here, uh, Christmas Eve. And then we're also going to have a Christmas Day service. So if you miss one, you go to the other, go to both, or watch online. <laughs> uh, so I think that is it. Okay. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Carol. And then um, there will be no kids programs, either service Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, um, partly because we're uh, a little lower with volunteers on those days, and they're going to be shorter services. So it'll be a lot of singing, and a lot of, um, it'll be a shorter devotional during that time. So it'll be good. Uh, but wanted to make sure that was announced. And then um, also, uh, I thought it'd be good right now if we could pray for Dennis Hankins. Uh, um, if you don't know, he had a mild heart attack on Wednesday, um, and he, I talked to him last night. He said he wasn't in pain at the moment, just um, as fun as it can be in a hospital room, but um, he's supposed to have uh, triple bypass surgery tomorrow, so um, if we can be praying for him, uh, and actually, let's do that right now. So, Father, I, we pray for Dennis right now. Lord, we thank you that um, even as I talked with him, uh, he recognizes, Lord, your hand just to get him there when you got him there. And, um, and Lord, you've watched over and protected him through the whole process. So, Lord, we pray right now that you would intervene in his body. We speak health, uh, body be healed, heart be healed. Lord, we pray uh, for the doctors and the surgeons. We thank you for their hands, that you would guide them and give them grace. 
uh, for the surgery, Lord, and, and Lord, that you would do something supernatural to his body, Lord, that if it is to go through surgery, Lord, that he would recover quicker than um, is even expected, because I know there's a lot of therapy, physical therapy from that. So God, be with him, uh, continue to be with the family, and um, Ellen and, and everyone during this time, and we thank you, God, that you're not only our healer, but you're our, our guide, our friend, our shepherd, and uh, even though, God, we can go through the valley of the shadow, Lord, we, will, we don't have to fear any evil because you're with us, Lord. And Father, since we're praying now, let, we pray for the, this message, Lord, that you would bless this time, uh, Lord, that your word would go forth, and Lord, may we be good soil that responds to what you're going to say today. Whether it's what comes out of my mouth or not, Lord, we pray that each person would respond to what you're saying to them. So, God, we say yes to what you want to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, I'm going to, I have an illustration, it's kind of an illustration, half announcement. Um, I'm going to talk about a time Rachel and I helped with kids' church uh, at our former, uh, the church we were at prior to being here in Terrebonne. Um, but, as I meant, but as I'm mentioning that, I thought I'd throw out really quick that uh, we're revisiting the idea of possibly doing something for um, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade on Sunday mornings, because uh, that's an age group we don't really have something for on Sundays. And it's a growing age group. Uh, the kids are growing. I don't know if you know that. They're growing into the, those ages, and we only do fourth, four years old to fourth grade at the moment, and then also nursery. So we need about three or four people who would be interested because at the that number we could probably pull off having every Sunday something for the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, um, but we do need some people to step up and say they'd be willing to at least once a month to do that. There is a background check. We, you do have to apply because we don't just let anybody jump in with our kids, um, but I, I know most all of you, if not all of you, and um, probably wouldn't be a problem, but just know there is a process. But if there's any sense that that's tugging on your heart, maybe you used to do kids ministry at one point, and you're like, ah. Ah, that, used to, that used to be my thing. That's not my thing anymore. Really ask the Lord, like, Lord, am I turning this down because I, I don't want to or because you don't want me to? Or, Lord, is it because you could be drawing me? So I just throw that out there because um, I really do think at some point in the near future that's going to happen, but it will require all of us hearing God together. So having said that, uh, during a particular Christmas at our, uh, the church we uh, I assistant pastored at in uh, Terrebonne, Day Spring Christian Center. Uh, Rachel was teaching a kids' church about, I'm trying to think what age age range, some older older kids. I'm really bad. I, I'm not a parent yet, and I, I look at someone this tall, and I'm like, you're almost as tall as me, and I don't really know sometimes, does that mean you're 10 years old, you're 12 years old, are you 8, 5, yeah. So... Um, all I, all I remember partly from this story, because it's integral to the story, is that it was during Christmas time. So Rachel had taught the lesson. We're all sitting at a table. There's, there were about three girls who were uh, sisters, and there were a couple of boys. And, um, you know, I put on some Christmas music in the back, and, and we're, we're at the craft point of the, the time. You know, we're coloring something. And on the radio or Spotify or whatever we're listening to that day, they start going into Jingle Bell Rock. You know, Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell Rock. I won't sing the whole thing. I'm tempted. But um, Jingle Bell Chimes and Jingle Bell Time. But at one point in the song, one of the, I think it's the second verse, the, the, it goes like this. Giddy up, jingle horse, pick up your feet, jingle around the clock. And one of the girls, and I'm going to guess she was like around six or something, uh, she goes, there's no such thing as a jingle horse. And she just said it with this really scowling face, and we're trying to explain to her and they had farm, they have farm animals, she's been around horses, and she knows horses. And she's trying to tell me, Kurt, this song's making something up, because there is no such thing as a jingle horse. I'm like, well, it's, it's a horse that jingles, because there's bells, and like, and she wouldn't have any of it, anything of it. She's just kind of, okay, well, gave me a look, and just kind of scourly, like, there's no such thing as a jingle horse. And ever since then, it's always stuck in my hand, mind, because like, I don't think I still convinced her to this day. There's, there, there is a jingle horse. It just, it's a horse that jingles. It's not like a Clydesdale or something. It's, um, and she just wasn't going to have any of it. And not only is that just a funny joke, Rachel and I occasionally go around and say, there's no such thing as a jingle horse um, during this time of year. It reminds me of how uh, we deal with issues of agreement when we're trying to get along together. 
And have you ever been in those moments where, well, it is the holidays, so you're around people and you don't always agree, right? And the question is, what does love look like when we don't agree? What does it mean to be loving when somebody's singing about a jingle horse and you know there's none of those? Or somebody's trying to be loving, but they voted differently, or someone's trying to be loving and they look different. Like, what does it love look like when we don't agree? And this is a really integral thing that's happening in the book of Romans. Uh, we are actually ending the series, by the way, today. If, if you didn't know, we were in a series. We've been in a series. This is part eight. And um, as a really quick review, as I've done every time, Paul is addressing an issue of unity. Today, we're talking about unity and fellowship. Uh, getting along, and the issue is between the Roman Christians and the Jewish Christians, whether they get along, and the answer to this problem is what? Christian is the gospel, right? And so Paul's basically saying, if you really knew the gospel and you were really living the gospel, then you wouldn't be having some of the issues you were having. He's not saying you'd be perfect, but the gospel is the answer for the tension. And, and part of that tension... Um, I can't remember if I explained this every single time, but historically what had happened was the Roman church had probably been started by Jewish Christians who got saved in Acts 2, were in Jerusalem during the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. They get saved, they go back to Rome, and then the Roman church is a bunch of these house churches run by Jewish Christians primarily. Well, around, I think it was 49 AD, uh, the Emperor Claudius, uh, we're not really sure why, but got really mad with the Jews in Rome and kicked out all the Jews from Rome. And so originally, the Jewish Christians were the majority in the house churches, and the Gentile, Greek-speaking Roman Christians were the minority. The, the Jews get expelled from Rome, and then after Claudius dies, they're able to come back, and they show up, and now in the Roman house churches, they're the minority because the Gentile-speaking Roman Christians keep Christianity going in Rome. And now you have this majority Greek-speaking Gentile culture and this Jewish culture trying to get along where they've historically never gotten along, but now they're supposed to be united under Christ. And Paul wants to visit them, but uh, he's not really... He's wanting to deal with some things before he gets there. And as I've mentioned before, the gospel, um, the thesis of the book is in Romans 1, 16 through 17. It says, "'For I'm not ashamed of the gospel.'" For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And then there's, I've talked about this throughout the, the series, but there's 12 arguments, and Paul builds on each of these arguments to basically show the gospel is the answer. Um, and as a, just a quick review of Romans 1 through 13, Romans 1 through 8 he lays out what the gospel means to everybody. Romans 9 through 11, he talks about the gospel doesn't mean God rejected Israel. God is actually fulfilling his word. Even if people haven't been faithful in history, God has always been faithful. And then in Romans 12 and 13, he starts talking about the practical implications of working out the gospel because the gospel isn't just something you're supposed to believe in your head. What does James talk about? We're not just supposed to be hearers of the word, but what? Doers of the word. Yeah, there you go. So, we're in the doing part of the book, where the first part was laying the kind of the ideas why you're going to have to do the unity thing that he's talking about. This is now how they should actually live it out. And so we talked about chapters 12 through 13 last week. This week, we're talking about chapters 14 through 16. It covers the last argument, which is argument 12. And um, as a quick preview of... Um, Argument 12 basically says gospel unity needs to be displayed in our fellowship, basically our getting along, and then gospel unity needs to be displayed in how we discern things together, because that's a really critical issue, because um, there's two groups, and one group discerns the way of the Lord one way, and one group's discerning the way of the Lord another way, and can they get along if they disagree what the will of God is in a moment? And so... Um, and then there's a conclusion, which I just lumped as chapter 15, uh, verse 14 through the end of chapter 16. There's multiple things happening in the conclusion. We're actually going to read it all. But he, he goes over the thesis. He talks about his travel plans to visit Rome. Um, he gives a couple doxologies, which are moments where he just, in his writings, like, praise the Lord. And he goes into how he, he praises God. 
He greets some different people, and then he concludes the book. So we'll read that, but I primarily want to focus on what would be argument 12. And it, before we read it, I want to kind of prepare you for what we're going to read, and then we're going to talk about how to kind of apply this, not kind of, but how we're going to apply this passage, or one way you could apply this passage. And um, what Paul's going to do, starting in chapter 14, is he's going to talk about two groups. He's going to talk about the strong and the weak. The strong and the weak. Now, it doesn't sound like a very nice thing to say, right? Like, one group's strong, one group's weak. But um, we're going to talk about why I think Paul uses this language. Um, but I am going to say, as a, as a quick note, that there is some disagreement when people interpret portions of the Bible where there's um, some ambiguity, like it's not super clear. There's a couple interpretations that could go either which way. But what I'm going to give you is, I believe what majority of scholars would say, or um, it's at very least a, a strong evangelical interpretation of this passage. Um, but it is an interpretation, so there's an element we can't be dogmatic about it. Um, having said that, because we've seen the whole book is based around this issue of Roman Gentile Christians getting along with Jewish Christians, likely the strong and weak refer to those two groups. And I'm going to propose to you that when we read this passage, when Paul talks about the strong, he's talking about the Roman Christians. And the strong we're going to read are those who are okay with eating meat uh, from the markets where vendors dedicate that meat to idols. And just to kind of help you understand what's going on, in the ancient world, generally all the time when they would kill an animal, they would thank their patron god for that animal. Um, whether it was pagan, whether it was Jewish, you know, they kill the animal and they're dedicating the food to the to whatever god it is. Sometimes it's actually a sacrifice to the god. Other times it's like, you know, thanks for this, or you know, there's different. Uh, you would say liturgies or things they would say, or um, but the idea was every time you're eating meat, something had to die, and that death is being given as a memorial unto your patron god. So the Romans and the Greeks. They're going to do it to Zeus, and they're going to do it to uh, Poseidon, and they're going to do it to all their gods, where the Jews are going to do it to Yahweh. And uh, one of the things God uh, basically tells them in the Old Testament is, you know, you can only eat meat, prepare it a certain way. You've got you've to be different in how you approach the table of eating, um, and it's one of the ways you're going to show the world that you're different. So that's always been historically how they approached everything. And now, Roman Christians who had always eaten meat in the market that was dedicated to idols um, their whole life are now with Jewish Christians who say, hey, we can't touch that. And so the strong, when Paul talks about the strong here, he's probably talking about uh, Gentile Christians who are okay eating the meat from the market, which has been dedicated to idols, and Jewish Christians who are, not, who are so concerned about it being kosher that it says they just eat vegetables. They're like, if we can't eat proper meat, we're just not going to eat meat at all. And so the weak describe, would describe Jewish Christians only eating vegetables. Um, the strong are the Gentile Christians eating this meat. And then the strong are also those who don't really feel like they have to observe the Jewish Sabbath, where, again, growing up Jewish, you would observe the seventh day as a day of rest because God commanded it. Um, there's actually an example of it in, in uh, the garden. God took a day of rest. And not wanting to get into a whole teaching on this, I actually think as Christians, we should follow a principle of Sabbath. So if you can take a day of rest, do it, please. And, and I would even try to ask, but when I say it's the principle, what I mean by that, just really practically, is you should ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what does it look like for me to take a Sabbath in this season of my life? Because I really think part of creation, we see this in Genesis 1, was that we need rest. And we live in a culture where there is no rest. You are doing, 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 doing all the time. But I don't, we're going to see how Paul basically says, you can call Saturday your Sabbath, you can call Sunday your Sabbath, you can call every day your Sabbath. But it's really between you and the Lord. And so I would never like, you know, I'm not going to say you can't do X, Y, and Z on a particular day, because that's, I don't think the New Testament doesn't allow that interpretation um, we're going to see Paul basically says, 
it's between you and God how you interpret it. I would encourage you, though, if you don't have a practice of Sabbath, you're like, Kurt, I can't fit a whole day into my schedule. Pray, pray and ask the Lord to help you fit a half a day, maybe two hours. But if you have a rhythm of rest, um, so much of what uh, we do when we do dumb things is because we're really tired, we're really stressed out, and I'll just speak for myself. When I do really dumb things, I'm really tired, I'm really stressed out, I'm overwhelmed. Um, when I don't say the things I should say, is, is I'm in those moments. And part of God's answer for that is having a rhythm of work and rest in your life. So I'd encourage you for that. But getting back to the passage, the strong, even if they had a sense of Sabbath, which I don't, we don't know historically if the Roman Christians did, they didn't think they had to observe the Jewish Sabbath. Because the Jewish Sabbath had certain procedures um, you light candles, it, it starts in the evening, Friday evening. You light candles, you say particular prayers, you do particular things. And the Roman Christians are like, we're not Jewish. We don't have to do a Jewish Sabbath. And the Jewish Christians are like, no, you need to. It's always what's been done. And um, so the week would be the, the, the Jewish uh, Christians who observe the Sabbath. They uh, maybe avoid... Uh, wine also because it's not kosher. And, and some of the reason I believe, and this is my particular interpretation, I haven't necessarily uh, found someone who particularly agrees with this aspect of it yet. Not that I found anybody who disagreed, but part of the reason I think the issue of Paul calling one group strong and one group calling them weak is not because he's saying you're, bad, you're good and you're bad. I think it's actually an issue of power because the Roman Christians were in more power in their con- had more power than of the Jewish Christians. When you're a minority in a majority group, you have less say so, right? If we do it, let's say we did everything democratically, which is not what they would have done, um, you're going to get outvoted every time. And in a culture that was extremely hierarchical, like uh, you can't imagine just Roman culture, they would fight in, in the Senate, in the military to always one up the next person. So their, secu- their pagan culture was always about trying to get ahead of the next guy. And now Paul's coming along and saying, hey, let's treat each other nice. And let's, let's be communal. And, and, um, and the Romans look down on the Jews just in general. And so I don't think Paul is saying they're weak because they're less than. I think he's saying they're in a weaker position than you. You guys are stronger and there would be other passages where I could show this, but the emphasis of Scripture is that when you have more power than somebody else, you have an obligation not to use that power for your advantage to their disadvantage. You have an obligation, if you are more powerful, to be loving, because what does God do? We had no ability to save ourselves, but God, out of his kindness, comes and does what no one else can do. Why? Because he has the power. Um, And so every time issues of power and powerlessness are brought up in Scripture, the emphasis is that the powerful have a responsibility. Why? Because they have the resources. It's not to say the powerless can just do whatever they want. If you don't have power, it doesn't mean you can burn buildings down and, you know, I won't get political. But anyways, um, you still have an obligation to be scriptural if you're a Christian for sure. Um, but the powerful do have an obligation and a responsibility to use their power in love, just like God does. Okay, so that's why I think he calls the, the Roman Christians strong and the other ones weak. Some would also say it could be an element of, like, the Romans had a stronger faith because they, they based their faith in now New Testament teaching, and the, and the Jews were basing it, well, they still felt like they needed to do the law, but I, I actually don't even like that interpretation because the reality is Paul's going to say it's really okay to eat whatever you want as long as your conscience is clean and, and Jews can still eat kosher if they want to. That's not bad. They can still eat kosher. Like, you know, you, you don't, I mean, this has historically happened where Christians would tell um, Jewish people, like, they come to know Jesus and they say, okay, you have to eat a ham now. Like, where's that in the Bible? You can eat whatever you want, and it has nothing to do, like, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you have to eat pork. I know a lot of Christians who don't like pork. I like bacon, so um, more pork for me, and you can send it my way. This likely, by the way, would have been the most contentious issue that was being felt with 
in between the Romans and Jewish Christians. Because in the ancient world, who you ate with was considered like your closest friends. So even Romans, like if you got, let's say you got invited to a rich person's house. If you weren't rich, you didn't get to sit at the rich people's table. They would even have their parties like, say, like um, broken down into groups. Like based on how important you were is how close you sat to the host. And based on how important you were was what kind of food you even ate. And that was even how Romans treated themselves, let alone cultures that they didn't even like. But now, Jews are wanting to eat one way. The Roman Christians are wanting to eat another. And Paul's like, you guys, you got to get together because we're loving Jesus. And just because you eat one way doesn't mean you have to like... um, uh, ju- you know, so basically what he tells us strong is don't despise the Jews for eating differently than you. Just let them do what they want. And Jews, don't judge the Romans because Jesus has basically said you can eat whatever you want and you're cool, okay? Not that you can eat poison and be fine, but, you know, you get the point. So he tells one group not to despise the other, one group not to judge the other, and this would have been really difficult for them to grasp, but that's why he put it at the end of the letter because he starts off with things they're all going to agree with. You know, we all like Moses. We like Adam. Oh, yeah, we like Jesus, and we like salvation and the gospel, and, oh, we like this renewing of our mind. And they're like, yeah, we agree with you. We agree with you. Wait a minute. You're talking about this thing? And so he hoped all the things he said up to this point is gonna, has gained um, a level of common ground. Like, they're going to think, okay, Paul seems to know what he's talking about. All right. Having said all that, we're going to read all three um, three chapters. I'm going to comment as I go, and then uh, we're going to talk about a few points of application from the passage, and then we'll wrap up the book, um, and then next week into a Christmas message. So, starting off, and uh, this is Romans 14, chapter 1, or Romans 14, verse 1. I read out the ESV. There's a lot of great translations, but if you want to follow, that's what you need to turn to in your little Bible app, or you can follow on the screen here. We're going to have uh, Romans 14, verse 1. Here we go. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each should be fully convinced in his mind. Again, we don't tell anybody what their Sabbath should be or look like, but I I think you should have one. It's really about between you and the Lord. Verse 6, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brothers? Or you, why do you despise your brothers? For we all stand before the judgment seat, for we will all, the future, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of it in itself, but is unclean for anyone who thinks that it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. He's basically telling the Romans, listen, if you eating meat in front of your Jewish brothers are going to bug them so much, maybe you should just hold off from meat for that particular meal. I mean, it's not like you eat with them every day. All right, keep going. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. 
For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whoever thus serves God is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. Whoever has doubt is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Basically, if you are doing something and you are not, you are in conflict whether you're trusting the Lord in what you're doing, then if it's not trusting God, you are then doing the opposite of trusting God. He's saying here. Um, so everything we need to do needs to come out of our trust of the Lord. Okay, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. See, Paul actually is going to identify himself with the strong group, even though he's Jewish, because he actually agrees that they can eat whatever they want. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For God did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's, he's, he's basically shifting to talk about you need to act like Jesus. What I'm asking you to do is how Jesus treated us. Verse 7, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I'll praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And now he's going to transition to kind of wrap up the whole book. He says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. He's got great hope that they're going to do the right thing. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. And he's about to talk about how he's all about the gospel, and it's not just a gospel of words, it's a gospel of power. God's showing up with his Holy Spirit. By power and deed, verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I long, have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain." And be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. So he wants their help to go preach the gospel in the new areas. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. And so he's basically going to now talk about how uh, the Gentiles around the ancient world have been helping out the poor in Jerusalem and that they should also do this as well. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to also be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. 
and know that when I come to you, I'll come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, literally the word deacon, a deacon of the church at Sancria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a, a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. And a lot of people believe all the names going through here are leaders of the house churches in Rome, by the way. Verse 5, greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners. They were well known to the apostles or well known among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Apollatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stychus. Greet Apellus, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philogus, Julia Nereus and his sister, Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with the holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Yes, I read all the names, and partly I did that because um, I want you to get a sense. Paul is not just this ivory guy in, in the clouds, um, ivory tower guy. He's, he relates to people. This is, the gospel is always about people. It's about a practical expression in our lives. Finally, Verse 14, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, Greets you, so is Lucius and Jason and Sospater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Guys, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother, Cortus, greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. So as we end Romans, we're just going to talk about some really practical application points as we end this letter. And the first, the first one is this. Our lives need to be about living for God. Our lives need to be about living for God. It says here in Romans 14, 7 through 8, it says this. For none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And this sounds really obvious. It's like, of course you're going to say our life needs to be about God. But sometimes as Christians, we get a little confused, and I know it's a guy thing at times. We compartmentalize things, and sometimes we compartmentalize certain areas of our life But then when the Holy Spirit says, let's talk about this area, we're like, ah, I gave you everything, but not that part. Like, we think what Jesus said, you know, you can have, you know, when we told Jesus, you can have my whole life, we had a little asterisk there. But this part, or these few parts. And the reality is, if you want the benefit of the gospel, if you want the benefit of Christianity, you have to give him your whole life. And I was trying to think of an illustration that uh, goes with this. And it really is kind of like giving a mechanic your car. You see, you have to trust that person with your vehicle to the point that you're willing to leave it with them. If you can't leave them your vehicle, how are they going to work on it? So I, 
I'm going to share some good experiences, some bad experiences. One time when I was in um, uh, Bible college, and there was a there was a uh, mechanic near the school, not too far from the school where I was at. And I go in, and I drop off my car, and I don't remember what he was doing. He might have even been changing the oil or something. It was something I took it to a mechanic, not a Jiffy Lube. I'm not. I'm I'm just not really skilled that way. I'm just going to tell you right now. So um, I took it to this guy, and. He calls, and my friend drops me off. I, I go in, I pay for the service, I get back in my car. And I had a, um, um, I had a like, one of those uh, upgraded radios that, you know, you kind of install, and then you can take the faceplate out. Well, I get in my car, and the faceplate's gone. And I'm like, what's going on? And so I get out, I get back, I go back in the place, and the guy had taken the faceplate out. He's like, I just wanted to teach you a lesson that you shouldn't leave these in here, and just because you left it with me doesn't mean like, yeah, it was just because you left it with me doesn't, you know, you should, you should always take that with you. And I was like, thanks. In my mind, I'm never coming back to you, and I never did. Um, I don't know if that was the right thing to do, but that wasn't good customer service. Um, I was probably still a teenager, but I'm like, I'm an adult, and if you're going to treat me like a kid, I will go somewhere else. And so... Um, I had a not as favorable an experience with a mechanic. But if I just use that experience to say, I'm never going to let somebody look at my car ever again, I would just never drive. Because I'm telling you right now, I have n- hardly any aptitude with vehicles. I have hardly any of the tools needed to fix something important. And I, I, I really don't have the time. And, um, and some could say you can make time, but I'm just being real. If I let my bad mechanic experience define how I would treat or trust mechanics in the future, um, I would be in a world of hurt where I thankfully know people like Tim, and Tim did me a solid the other day or a couple months ago where I I, I bought the part, but um, he installed the, I have a truck now, and uh, the blinkers weren't, the turn signals weren't working. And so he switched out for me, but I had to leave my truck at his place, and, and, um, and I had to trust him. And I had to say, you know what? Um, I'm going to believe that Tim is different than previous mechanics I've dealt with. And, and he is, and he's a great guy. Um, so he's not only a good drummer, he's a good mechanic. Um, and, and yeah, he didn't, yeah, I didn't have a faceplate for him to steal. Um, yeah. <laughs> All those parts on the inside, I don't know, are missing now, are missing. Um, but the reality is some of us treat God like this, is we've had problems with our, our father, we've had problems with uh, some authority figure, we've had problems with a boss, a spouse, a sibling, and we think God cannot be trusted. But I'm here to tell you, if you withhold anything from him, you don't get the benefits of leaving your life with him. And for some of us that are like, oh, I don't know if I can, I'm just telling you right now, even if you, in your weakness you're like, Jesus, I don't know if I can give it to you, help me give it to you. Just be real, Lord. I'm not sure if I can trust you. Help me trust you. The guy who says, I don't, um, uh, I believe, help my unbelief. Like, Jesus is available, but you got to give it to him. You got to give it to him. All right. Second point I want to make is Paul talks about living for God, partly because he's now going to talk about living for harmony with one another. So in Romans 15, verses 5 through 7, we read this. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So can we live in harmony if we disagree? I'm not going to look at anybody. If we can disagree about masks, can we live in harmony if we disagree about politics? Can we live in harmony if we disagree about what we can or can't eat or what we can or can't watch? And I'm not saying I don't have opinions about these things myself, but can we allow different opinions to exist in our group? Can we, can we evangelize and tell people about the gospel even if their opinion about something is not something we like? I remember one time that um, I, uh, my first year of college, I went to Arizona State University because that's where I, I lived, uh, about 45 minutes away from Tempe at the time. And it just made sense for me to go there, longer story. But um, I had a friend from high school, um, uh, uh, Trung, he's a f- fun um, Vietnamese guy, really feisty. But 
uh, we went to the same school, and we would kind of connect now and then as we would go to school at different points. But one time he, invites, he uh, introduces me to his friend Jonas, uh, a German student who is now living in the States. And at one point in the conversation, we start talking about the Lord, and we start segueing into, like, why I'm a Christian. Well, Trung, for whatever reason, immediately pipes up about some political positions I took, about I, I voted for someone in particular, and I took the bait, and I commented on what he said, and instead of talking about the gospel, we changed the whole conversation to talk about politics. Now, I'm not going to say that your, your beliefs in Christ should not affect your politics, but I realized really quickly that I could lose the opportunity to tell someone about Jesus if I get confused on what was the most important thing. Now, I think it is very important who you vote for, and I think it is important as a Christian that you should vote based on your beliefs. And I do think there are political issues that are actually moral issues that, um, like abortion, I, I don't think it's right to kill babies. I don't, yeah. So, but having said that, um, I could easily go, because I come from a family of like, um, can I say debaters? Like, we, my, my parents are in the front row. Um, maybe it's the German side of us. Maybe it's, I don't know. But like, we, uh, I mean, I, I've just, the Lord has refined me over the years that I can, I can now have conversations with people that I have different opinions and, and they can walk away. And for me, that's the question. Can someone walk away from a discussion with me knowing I disagree with them but still feel loved? And that's the question we need to ask with ourselves. Can people l- disagree with us and still walk away? It's like, man, that person's so dumb, but they still, they, they love me. You know, and, and we not get offended that they just called us dumb. Um, you know, Erwin McManus uh, was this uh, pastor of a church in, uh, uh, called Mosaic in L.A. And one time he preached on the, uh, how, how biblically... Um, Scripture, it says marriage is between a man and a woman, how um, human sexuality is defined that way. And, and he preached this message. Well, he had a person in his church because his church was literally, uh, I don't know where Mosaic is. It's either in downtown LA or it's near Hollywood. But it was in the middle of a bunch of people who would definitely disagree with his opinion. And he had a whole lot of people show up at his church. And so he gets this email that week from this guy who's attending his church who's gay and who's like... He was like, Erwin, this is why this point is wrong. This is why this point is wrong. This is why this point is wrong. And he goes through, like, I think he had 14 points of why this sermon he thought was just wrong. And at the end, he said, and I look forward to seeing you Sunday. And Erwin said, the guy felt loved. He knew I entirely disagreed with what he thought or what he did. But he felt loved enough that he could be with me, even though he knew I would even preach against something that he lived out in his own life. And, and that's what I want for our church, and I believe that's what the Lord wants for us, is that people could live in such harmony with us. Why? Because we have the love of Christ. Not that we ignore our convictions. Not that we don't call a spade a spade. But when Jesus says, speak the truth in love, I think some of us need to emphasize the love piece, not us, but like the church in general, the love piece and less truth part. Because part of the truth is the love of Christ. Amen? Amen? And the final point is Paul not only is talking about living in harmony, he's talking about living for building up others. So harmony could mean I just keep my mouth shut so I don't offend somebody, right? And sometimes that is important. But living for building up others is means now I'm going to actually use my words to bless other people. I'm not only going to be silent when I shouldn't say something bad. And actually, that's an issue of your heart. You should go to the Lord about that. Because um, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. But I should actually, instead of just being silent, I should use my words to build somebody up. Maybe I could even say something nice about a politician I don't like. Or maybe I could even say something nice about that coworker who drives me crazy. Romans 14, 19 says this. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. For mutual upbuilding. And part of the thing I have to do when I'm trying to like control my words and not say something mean or dumb or whatever, I have to say, you know, what I feel like saying right now, am I saying it because it's going to make me feel better or am I doing it for their sake? 
And I'm not saying there's not times you need to, like, process something with somebody. There's not times you need to uh, uh, confess something. There's not times you need to uh, be real and vulnerable. These are complex things, but we should take our words through a grid of, am I saying this just for me, or am I saying this for the other person? Uh, You ever had somebody walk up to you? I personally haven't, but I know quite a few people who've had this, where the person was like, you know, I just need to tell you, um, all these things I've hated about you, but the Lord's told me not to, like, hold those things against you. But the way they shared it was almost in a way of, like, unloading on you. This is how I really feel about you, but God's told me not to think that way. Um, but did that person really do that because the Lord told them because, or because it made them feel better? And so, like, you know, I think of, funny illustration, but I used to have a, a, a dog who sadly passed before we moved here. But when we first got this dog... Um, he was I'm trying to think how much he weighed at the time. He was probably at least five pounds. I don't think 10, but he was at least five pounds overweight. Um, he actually ended up in the shelter he was in probably because he, because he was with someone um, who was probably older or disabled who couldn't take care of him anymore, and he was all matted with hair um, and just hadn't been really cared for much, but they apparently just left him a lot of food. And getting to know my dog later, my dog will... It's not one of those dogs you can just leave his food out and he'll eat it when he needs to eat. If you stick anything in front of him, he'll eat it. And he won't stop himself. And so there were times where having my dog, um, he would just want whatever, not only whatever I'm eating, and I know that's common for all dogs, but he just want to eat at all certain times. Well, I knew if I just fed him every time he felt like it, he would probably die because he, he was the dog who would probably eat himself to death. He was this size, and he could easily get, like, you know. Um, and there's points where, am I feeding him because I just want to, uh, because, you know, I just want to bless him, or I, I just want to, like, make it easy, or just, you know, stop bugging me here, eat your food, or I just leave his food out because I don't want to, like, think about feeding him on time. Like, am I doing something because it's easier for me, or am I doing something because it cares for my dog, even when it doesn't make my dog happy and I'm not so always happy? And again, we have to take our words and our actions through that phrase. Am I treating somebody the way that's for their upbuilding, or am I doing it for my own upbuilding? And I want to encourage you that there is a lot of joy when you embrace a lifestyle of actually thinking about other people's needs above your own. Because one of the most um, uh, discouraging, despairing, one of the most depressing things to do is to live for your needs above everybody else. Because when you do that, um, a life of selfishness is not a life of joy. It can be a life where you have happy moments, but one of the most joyful things you can experience is letting Jesus show you the, the pleasure of actually caring for others. Not that it's not sacrifice and not that it's not pain at times. And that's partly why Paul is writing this letter because he knows it's not easy for the Roman Christians and the Jewish Christians to get along. It's not easy for them to build each other up. But he knows that this is the way that life flows. Life flows into them. Life flows out of them. I I like to think of us kind of like a hose. If you hold up good things coming to you, through you, you're holding up good things coming to you. If you, if you stop up grace flowing through you, you've really stopped up experiencing that grace yourself. The most, some of the most judgmental people are the most feeling judged themselves. And so this is not, by the way, a condemnation. This is just a call, like Paul says at the beginning of Philippians 1, where he says, I know of your love, and I just pray that it would abound more. This is an extremely loving church, um, and we love well but let us love more and more because we live in an age now where it's just easy for the craziness to get to us. Can I just be real? Like, it's just easy. It's easy for me. Like, um, every everybody can feel like they're running around with their heads on fire and everyone's screaming and there's chaos. And Christians are coming along and say, we're going to love in the middle of chaos. We're going to believe God is bigger than the chaos. We're going to bring peace. We're going to bring love. We're going to bring the Holy Spirit. But it takes sometimes an intentional effort of saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So let me, uh, let me pray for you, and then I have one other thing to do after that. So, Father, I pray, 
right now that as we close this series out of understanding how the gospel helps us be more united, God, help us do what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, that we would be a people who would say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, if, if there's anything we've done against someone else, Lord, we repent. We just need to tell the Lord, repent now and know that if you repent, God forgives you right now. He's not holding that over you. He doesn't want you to feel bad the rest of the day. But he does want you to seek them on how to treat that person differently. God, I pray for family situations. I know the holidays can bring this up where we might have complicated situations. We might have complicated relationships with those we know or love. Lord, help us. Love others the way you loved us. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom. God, I don't really <laughs> sometimes worry about whether I'm that smart or not, but Lord, I know that you're smart. So Lord, speak to me, speak to us, so that our words align with you, our actions align with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And then I, I will do a call if anybody doesn't know the Lord today, but I, I felt during worship... Um, uh, to do an, to do a different kind of altar call as well before I do that, and um, I'm just going to give you as if I had this really strong sense that there was freedom for people today, and it, I felt like there was nothing to do with my message. But um, but guess what? If you need freedom, the Lord knows, and He doesn't care whether I was on schedule with a particular message or not. If you need freedom in Christ, you can experience that today. And I specifically felt um, that if there was anybody who needed freedom in the area of smoking cigarettes, like, um, I just felt like the Lord said he wanted to bring people freedom for that. But I also felt there was freedom for other areas. And I, I, I kept, like, like, whether it was smoking weed or porn or maybe there's an addiction that maybe other people are like, that's not a bad addiction. But you know that the Lord doesn't want you to do that. I mean, people can get addicted to TV or all sorts of things. Um, in a way that's unhealthy video game, I mean, just whatever. And I just felt like the Lord wants to bring freedom to people today. And some of that is going to start with you saying, Jesus, right now, I'm saying that was not the way I should have lived, and now I want to move forward differently. And so it does require a choice today, but I am going to tell you that if you, all you do is agree with me in prayer this morning, that's not the only thing the Lord wants you to tell somebody. Because the only reason I ever walked in any level of uh, purity in the area of lust or anything like that was because I would confess it to people I would trust, and they would help me, and they would pray with me. And you need to find people you can trust who are going to not, like, freak out. And if you don't know anybody, you can definitely tell me I don't freak out. Um, I've, I've done a lot, and I've seen a lot, and, like, it's, we're, all, we're all human and the reality is God has freedom for every person in the room. But part of walking in freedom is, what does it say in Scripture? That we confess our sin one to another. You see, some people threw the baby out the bathwater with the Reformation when, uh, you know, Luther was, you know, some people were like, well, you don't have to confess it to a priest. But then the Protestants thought, you don't have to confess it to anybody, and that's not actually scriptural. It's in, you break the power of things when you tell other people about it because um, sin grows in secret. It's kind of like mold grows when you keep it moist and in the dark. And God wants that to come out into the light. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to invite us, not yet, but in a moment, and bow our heads. And if there's anything that you're thinking, man, I, I, I have an addiction or, or I have a habit, and I'm not even going to ask you what it is, but you just, Actually, I'm going to do it this way because I know sometimes that can be awkward to raise your hand because the person next to you knows that you raised your hand. But I do feel like there's supposed to be a response this morning. I'm just going to ask you to look up at me. And, and you can just, but make sure you meet my eyes. And, and again, it's not about me knowing something. It's about you taking a step of opening up to somebody this morning, You're, to me, to the Lord, and then you do need to tell somebody else. But I'm here to tell you that God is doing this only because he's saying there's freedom. There is freedom for people. You do not have to walk the way you've walked. Like, I, I just have this sense, and I don't even know if it's the Lord or not, but it's just this picture of like, all, all, it's like angels are in the room ready to just start taking stuff off people. You're, you're just going to hand it to the Lord. 
And they're just going to like, all right, we're taking that. We're taking that. And what you're doing is you're taking that right, that thing's right to be there. Because you're declaring that Jesus is Lord of my life. Nothing else gets to rule me. All right? So let's just do this right now. So let's bow our heads. And for the sake of privacy, and I, and I really do mean that, let's just let's respect one another. But if there is something you're like, Kurt, I, I, need, I need to declare right now that I haven't been walking in freedom, but I want to walk in freedom. If you would like, if that is you this morning, just look up at me, and I would, so I'm not, okay, I'm acknowledging different people in the room. I don't know what it is, but I'm saying the Lord sees you, the Lord knows. And actually, let's just all do this together, and if you don't mean it, you don't have to say it. Probably no one's going to hear you if you don't say it. But if you're a believer and, and this is you, um, and let's just say this all together. Uh, we're going to just declare that we're Jesus's. I'm going to just lead you through some declaration that we belong to God. So just say, Father, I belong to you. Sin doesn't own me. Addiction doesn't own me. Wrong mindsets don't own me. You own me. Jesus, you own me. Holy Spirit, you own me. I declare I'm a child of God. I declare I'm a child of God. I am more than a conqueror. And I am free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. I am free. I am free. And I am free. Thank you, Jesus, that you freed us. And I'm going to pray for you. So, Father, I pray for every single person in this room who is making a statement this morning to you, to me, to the kingdom of darkness, to every principality in the world that we belong to you. So, Father, I pray that there would be power this morning to walk in your freedom. I thank you, God, that the gospel hasn't lost its power, but just like Paul said, by signs and wonders, and one of the most wondrous things is the changed life. I thank you, Lord, that, yeah, and some of you, I just feel like the enemy is trying to lie to you right now and saying, it's not working, it's not working, and I'm telling you right now, it's a lie, in Jesus' name. Jesus says you are free. Jesus says you're free. And if there's anybody in this room, again, all heads bowed, that would say, Kurt, I don't even walk with Jesus this morning, but I want to, if or I've been not walking with him, but I want to. If that's you, if you just want to raise your hand and say, Kurt, I, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to give my life to him. Is there anybody in this room who can say, I'm giving my life to Jesus this morning? And if you're online or you're here or you're listening to this later, you can simply repeat this after me and say, Lord, I give my life to you. I give you my sins. I receive your forgiveness. I give you my brokenness. I receive your wholeness. I, re I give you my loneliness. And I receive your spirit and your family. Thank you, Lord, that I'm now a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we do have food today, so uh, please stay in fellowship with us. And maybe here, maybe not here, you can tell me, but if you don't tell me, please tell somebody else that you've made a decision today to walk in freedom. Because when you get that stuff in the light, it loses its power, and you're going to start a journey. And maybe it's just a person. You're, by the way, if someone comes to you, you don't have to give them advice. You might like, oh, no, what am I going to do with it? Just pray with them and just be available. It's not a count, it doesn't have to be a counseling session. It can just literally, actually, that'd probably be good. You don't have to make it any sort of advice. It's just, I need somebody to know so they, they can walk with me, all right? So have